This video covers pediatric neuromuscular conditions. We're going to start with hydrocephaly or hydrocephalus. Um, this is a condition and this is a, obviously a very old photo from with a child with a lot of issues but certainly way before uh, treatments existed for hydrocephaly. Um, but what would happen is the fluid, excessive fluid accumulation would dilate the cerebral ventricles and um, since the bones of the skull aren't fused yet, it, it results in ex expansion of the skull itself and the head itself. Um, so it is a condition. It's marked by excessive accumulation of fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid, and this dilates the ventricles, thins the skin, and separates the cranial bones. Causes um, excessive production of cerebrospinal fluid, blockage of the flow, and we'll go through the path a little bit, and then lack of absorption of cerebrospinal fluid. So when we look at the anatomy here, uh, this is obviously a side view, and remember that we have two lateral ventricles, so those are ventricles one and two. We have um, the third ventricle, and then, the and then the fourth ventricle. And this little aqueduct here is the place that we often see blockages. So spina bifida, for example, is an area in which we often will see a blockage and that will cause a backup of the fluid. Um, you may remember from neuro that the fluid gets produced, um, flows down through the lateral ventricles, through the third ventricle aqueduct, fourth ventricle, um, can come back up around, it can also flow down and through the spinal cord. So of course with spina bifida, we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but with spina bifida, being a disorder of the formation of the end of the spinal cord, it can disrupt the flow. Um, the other reason we could see is that uh, when, this, when the cerebral spinal fluid circulates back up, it does not get absorbed. And so basically it's an imbalance. Too much cerebral spinal fluid, not enough absorption. Symptoms of, as we saw, excessive rate of growth of the head circumference and again if you've been on any well baby visits you know that they always measure the size of the head, the circumference of the skull. This is one of the reasons to do it. Looking at separation of the cranial sutures and you know the fontanelle is the little soft spot on the top of the baby's head and the um, that area will become larger and that skin there will become tighter and thinner. Because of the pressure that it puts on the brain it will cause a high-pitched cry in an infant along with downward deviation of the eyes and if this proceeds unchecked of course that uh, could ultimately be fatal for the child. So treatment is pretty straightforward. They place a shunt. They basically drain off the excess cerebrospinal fluid um, out of the lateral ventricles. Uh, you can generally see or feel the shunt kind of passing behind the child's ear. Um, comes down through the thoracic outlet and then just empties into the peritoneal cavity where it's just absorbed. So that's hydrocephalus. We're going to go on to spina bifida. Uh, the technical term for that, myelodysplasia. Um, or you may see, we may describe the actual um, defect which is a myelocele or else a myelomeningeal seal. So this is also a developmental issue. So when we think about the developmental process as the uh, spinal cord is developing and the bones are developing, there's a defect in the way that that, that develops and it allows the meninges to protrude out through um, the ligaments, through the maybe through the lamina, through the ligaments, and to kind of create a big balloon of cerebrospinal fluid. Now that's called a myelocele. If the spinal cord also goes out and the spinal nerve roots go out and protrude as well, that's a myelomeningocele. So if it's just a myelocele, um, all the nerve roots in the spinal cord are intact, there's really no neurological problem. This will just be surgically removed and closed and it won't be an issue. Um, however, if the nerves are protruding, the baby will present essentially as either an incomplete or a complete um, spinal cord injury. So um, it depends on what level 
this this occurs, it, it is always in the low lumbar, well, I shouldn't say always, it's in the lower part of the spinal cord, so typically in the lumbar or either the sacral area. Um, but as you learned last semester with spinal cord injury, the deficits that you see are going to depend specifically on the level of spinal cord that's involved or spinal nerve roots that are involved, and also whether or not it's a complete or incomplete. So some of the impairments we might see, um, certainly with the trunk, if there's trunk weakness, we might see kyphosis or scoliosis, which could also include a forward head. Um, if abdominal weakness, we tend to see excessive lordosis because of the inability, we don't have the abdominals to stabilize the trunk and keep the pelvis more level. Um, we can see some musculoskeletal um, developmental problems like antiverted hips, um, tibial torsion, which is essentially excessive twisting of the tibia, along with um, hip subluxation and pronated feet, and even again club feet or equinovarus. I mentioned motor and sensory deficits would go along with whatever type of um, spinal nerve involvement we had. We just talked about hydrocephalus, we can see that. Um, children with spina bifida may have cognitive involvement or delays, especially if a hydrocephalus is, in, is included, but you may also have children who have absolutely no cognitive involvement whatsoever. Um, so a, the rest of those symptoms basically would be involved um, if there was compression on the brain and the functioning of the brain. The skin breakdown, um, neurogenic bowel and bladder again would go, down, go along if we had sensory loss, um, neurological involvement of the spinal cord. And then uh, we do often see these kids being, being fairly heavy. Oh, went a little fast. So this is an actual picture, and I believe you may have seen some of these similar photos in uh, your neuro class. So again, equinovarus going along with, um, may go along with spinal bifida. So what we're looking at um, with infants, our goals in physical therapy, uh, as we talked about when we talked about the NICU, is it's really important that parents understand how to do appropriate um, positioning of the patient as well as appropriate handling. We want to make sure we're facilitating the muscle activity that they do have and preventing contractures in the areas where they don't have adequate muscle activity. So we, they need to, the parents need to learn how to perform range of motion and stretching exercises. And then also the goals would be to uh, make sure that we're strengthening and optimizing the muscles the child does have that are intact. So uh, from an infant standpoint, we would be working on head control, trunk control, you know, sitting balance, things like that. As the child gets older then, uh, we would look for their, cap their ability to ambulate, and I'll show you a little um, chart on that um, in just a minute. Uh, this chart that you see here just basically tells you how they would um, assign the motor level, and it's, it's similar to what you talked about with spinal cord injury. Um, it's certainly not anything I'm going to test you on, but I just wanted to to share that with you, and again, you can see that the the low, the highest motor level you're probably going to see is about uh, is in the very low thoracic area. Um, I actually want to go here. Uh, this is the potential for ambulation of children with spina bifida, and again, if you look in that second column, right here, this is the motor level. So again, above T10 to T12. They're not going to have any lower extremity movement, of course, but they'll have a very strong trunk, and so they certainly um, would be able to stand with a parapodium, which is a standing frame. They may be able to stand with HKAFOs. So do you remember how, what, how we named these? These are, uh, this is a uh, brace or splint, so we just name them by the joints they cross. So in order for a child at this level to stand, they would need hip, knee, ankle, foot orthoses. Um, so what we're talking about here is what's the potential of them to ambulate. So um, their typical functional activity certainly um, 
good sitting balance. Um, they, they are probably going to not be functional ambulators, but certainly independent with wheelchair mobility. Uh, up in the T10 to T12, they may well have spasticity um, because, of course, it's above L1, and it could, that would still be upper motor neuron. If these words aren't making sense, you need to go back and review uh, spinal cord anatomy and your symptoms of spinal cord. But as we go down into the lumbar areas, of course, uh, with every level, we're going to add strength. And you can see I kind of wrote in um, gluteus medius at um, L4 to L5, S1, L5 for the medial hamstrings. So as we go down into the lumbar area, we're adding muscles. And so, of course, we're going to diminish the amount of um, splinting and external support we need. And the more likely that we're going to go from household to community ambulation. Um, and again, in the sacral area, they're usually very, very functional ambulators. So again, back to our goals for older children, we really need to look at the level and the impairments that they exhibit and see what, how practical it is for them to ambulate. Um, we certainly want them to ambulate and to, to be able to stay, you know, commensurate with their peers if, if, that's, a if that's a regional functional goal. If they have sensory loss, they need to be able to make sure that they can do skin inspection and pressure relief. We want to look at posture issues. Um, if they've got some skeletal deformities and accompanied by some muscle weakness, that would increase their chance for scoliosis, kyphosis, things like that. Um, I already mentioned we're going to work on strengthening all the innervated muscle groups, work on endurance. We want to prevent contractures, and, uh, and if they had neurological uh, brain involvement, we may need to also look at motor skills. Now I mentioned um, that if they had hydrocephalus, they're going to need to have a shunt, and it's very important that you understand the warning signs if uh, the shunt isn't working right. So it's not unusual at all for the shunt to become blocked. Um, it can it can become infected, which again can also block it. So it's the blockage that's really an issue, and you want if, and essentially what what happened then, of course is the pressure would build up in the ventricles and put pressure on the brain. So some of the warning signs you'd look at would be changes in speech, uh, recurring headache, decreased performance at school or activity level, um, incontinence may become an issue, you know, personality changes, uh, memory changes. I haven't worked with children with shunts, but I've certainly worked with adults who've had shunts and, you know, um, decreased level of cognitive arousal, poor memory, um, things like that, you know, definitely see cognitive changes. And so with a child and someone you know who has a shunt, you need to be aware of those and certainly you need to educate the child and their family in what those signs would be. So here's an example of HKAFOs. So again, you can see that they're crossing the hip, so they, come, they have to come up around the trunk and around the hip area. Um, the KAFOs, remember, would be at this level. So they kind of start here just because they're only going to do the knee and the foot and the ankle. Uh, but KAFOs are going to come up pretty high and provide a lot of stability. Another version might be a reciprocating gait orthosis. Um, you may have talked about ambulation and spinal cord injury uh, with a with a Orthosis like this, whether it's an HKAFO or KAFOs, the way that they can do ambulation is they have to swing both legs through at the same time. And that doesn't look like a very typical gait pattern. And so a reciprocating gait orthosis also comes up around the trunk, but these little cords that you see here allow for one foot to be advanced and then the other. So it allows for a more natural gait pattern. So here you see a couple examples of little kids, and uh, this on the right is a reciprocating gait orthosis. So that child, and you can see he's got the right leg in front and the left leg behind. Um, it looks to me like this little girl only probably has KAFOs on, but I can't really tell. Um, but you see her ambulating with a wheeled walker, so definitely some looking at early opportunities for gait, you know, as early as we can within whatever would be the normal developmental cycle. You do have a case study on spina bifida, 
So we want to make sure that you take a look at that and you come prepared with lots of great ideas to address that and to share in class. We're going to go on to Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and you may just be a little surprised that that word Duchenne is in front of it. Uh, there actually are many, many forms of muscular dystrophy. It's a, I don't even know how many, 20 or 30 different forms. So Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is a very specific type. This is the most prevalent type and um, a muscular dystrophy is a, a disease primarily of muscle. So I put it in the neuromuscular section, but there's nothing neurological about it. It doesn't affect the nerves at all. It is a disease um, whereby the muscle progressively gets weaker because it basically, um, the muscle tissue degenerates and gets replaced with fat and connective tissue. And unfortunately, this is still a disorder in which um, we do see mortality occurring in the late teens or early 20s. This is an, a recessive genetic disease, and it's one of those that are called X-linked. In other words, it's only carried on the X chromosome, and since it's recessive, uh, you have to, um, you would have to have either two of them, since it's, you'd have to have a, a daughter with two X's, um, or you would have to have a, a boy with just with the uh, X dis with the X that carried that chromosome. So, um, since only males get it and they tend to die young, they generally do not. I don't know of any instances where they have children. So, the mother is going to be the carrier for it. Um, so they would have a 50% chance of having children with without the disease at all. 25% chance of having a daughter who's a carrier, and then 25% chance of having a son that does have muscular dystrophy. This is a chronic progressive disease. So it's chronic, which means what? Yep, never goes away. Progressive means, yes, it continually gets worse. So chronic progressive disease. So you see here, um, from left to right, you see kind of a progression of um, as the child gets weaker and weaker. And symptoms typically show up uh, about three to five years of age. So as a as a younger child and at the high end of toddlerhood, three to five years of age, the child's going to be perfectly normal. The effects of the disease haven't occurred yet. Um, what we see as we progress is as the abdominal muscles weaken, we see the lordosis being accentuated, um, and concurrently we see uh, knee hyperextension, uh, both because of the anterior weight shift from the increased lordosis, but also from the weakening in the quads. Um, we see in this case, in, in these two boys, they're using scapular retraction to improve spinal stability. Here we see kind of more of a kyphotic posture with a bit more of a forward head, again showing us weakness in the trunk. Uh, this is a very classic sign, it's called the Gower's sign, and um, it's one of the early signs that they use to identify children, and I, I know it kind of looks like a girl because of the long hair, but it is a boy. Um, so when a child is getting up off the floor, if you think about how kids normally get up, they just kind of jump up and run around. So this child is um, kind of pushing up and then kind of walking up their legs. And we see this because of the weakness in the, in the knee extensors and the hip extensors, that they're unable to arise from the floor, where kids do a lot of playing, and get up. So again, that's another common sign that you might see. So there isn't a lot to offer these kids, um, unfortunately. Uh, we use steroids to try to and control and diminish the inflammatory response that occurs as the myopathy progresses. Um, secondary complications um, do include contractures, scoliosis. Um, ultimately, these kids aren't going to be ambulatory and they're going to be long-term wheelchair users. And so um, as the trunk continues to weaken and they're in a sedentary posture, they're going to continue to, um, they're going to have scoliosis. So they may be to the point where they need surgery to affect that. Um, a lot of the current research is looking at um, gene replacement, gene transfers, that kind of thing to try to actually replace the um, protein 
that gets disabled within the muscular dystrophy. For children below the age of five when they're diagnosed, they may have some muscle weakness and what's called pseudohypertrophy. Since the muscles are being replaced by fat and connective tissue, um, some of the muscle groups, in particular the gastrocnemius, can actually look very bulky. So I think this is a good example of that. Um, you can definitely see that the child looks like he has very large gastrocs and like they would be really strong, but that's actually um, tissue that's been replaced by fat and connective tissue. You certainly see other signs of weakness, the winging scapula indicating serratus anterior and upper trunk weakness. Um, you can see that he has an ex uh, definitely has a lordosis. Um, not sure why he's kind of shifted on one side or the other, but we definitely see some signs of um, postural changes and weakness. Uh, he is an older child. He's obviously over the older five, but um, with the pseudohypertrophy and the replacement, um, we definitely see tightening of the tissue as well. So. Um, that may be why he's kind of up on this. He may have a little bit of a plantar flexion contracture. Uh, we also can see uh, tensor fascia lata tightness as well. As I mentioned before, as the child ages, you may see um, uh, inc definitely an increase in, this, in the lumbar lordosis along with the scoliosis. Um, you do see children walking up on their toes because of the plantar flexor tightness as well as the Trendelenburg sign from weakness. Um, I showed you the Gower sign before. Um, as far as functional activities, definitely trouble climbing stairs, getting up off the floor, and just a gradual decrease in their ability to keep up with their peers. Because of the inactivity then, we can also see, and, and the muscle weakness, we can see pulmonary impairments, and generally uh, what is ultimately fatal is usually respiratory failure from lack of um, the musculature to be able to do respiration. So we aren't going to be um, this is not a disease we're going to cure or improve. So this is a type of chronic condition where physical therapy wants to be episodically involved as the child's functional mobility is changing to help them uh, stay as functional as possible, but maybe transition from, um, if they're ambulatory, to an assistive device. Um, then if they're not able to be ambulatory anymore, to, um, to a transition to an appropriate wheelchair, to look at positioning within that wheelchair to prevent deformities. So those are the types of interactions. Um, we want to keep the, make sure the, the family is able to continue to keep the child, you know, independent and mobile as possible within the home. Um, there is a case study for muscular dystrophy. Uh, I just want to let you know that even though muscle weakness is the primary issue, because this is a myopathy, a disease of muscle, actually using resistive exercises. Uh, you might remember back from therapeutic exercise when we talked about strengthening, we said that we needed to um, be cautious of overwork with patients who have neuromuscular disorders. And this would be example of that, that we don't want to be too aggressive because we could actually cause increased loss of strength rather than um, an increase in strength as we are hoping to do. Um, so generally we don't do um, targeted resistance exercises, but we try to keep the child as functional as possible within their activities. So we do definitely, the uh, literature does highly recommend standing or walking a few hours a day as long as that that's possible, but as we wouldn't do a specific strengthening exercises. So again, if you can take some time to look over that case study before we get to class, that'll be helpful. We'll go on now to Down syndrome, also called trisomy 21. So trisomy meaning three, um, in this case, three chromosomes. So this is a kind of a picture of the chromosomes all paired up and lined up. So we, as I'm sure you're aware, we have 23 pair. Uh, this is a, a boy because we have an X and a Y. If it was a girl, we would have two X chromosomes. And then we have the other 22 chromosomes, other 22 pair. And the chromosome, which should be a pair of 21, with Down syndrome, we actually have three of those. And with, with genetics, anytime you have more, too much, or too little genetic material, it's going to be a problem. So this is a, a, um, 
occurs during an error in cell division. So what happens is instead of the um, the pair splitting and going their separate ways, all the you know three of the chromosomes end up in one cell. Um, so the impairments that we see definitely impairments in growth and skeletal maturation. Uh, so we tend to see uh, children and ultimately adults of, of short stature. Um, they have very uh, specific visual or facial changes. Um, the kind of the inner fold in the eye, we see kind of a flattened, broader nose. Um, so it interferes with some development of the of the facial area and the head. Uh, has some often hearing impairments are common, cardiac impairments are common, intestinal malformations can occur. Definitely, lots of kids with uh, Down syndrome have visual impairments, so you tend to see a lot of kids with glasses. Um, there is cognitive delay, or so anywhere from um, a very a generally lower IQs. From a motoric standpoint, we see low muscle tone, um, so hypotonicity tends to be an issue. So we work a lot with these kids on increasing muscle tone, increasing stabilization, increasing endurance and strength, um, and working on motor planning and, and coordination. One of the other things that we see uh, with these children is that as they age, and they generally, uh, I've seen many of these people grow to to an older age in their 50s, 60s, and many of them, there's a very high incidence of development of Alzheimer's disease that that has a pretty early onset. So after like the age of 35 or 40, they start to see um, changes related that are due to Alzheimer's disease. So there's something in that extra chromosome that also does something with the proteins in the brain. Um, I believe you talked quite a bit about Down syndrome and neuro, so we aren't, um, I don't have more information for that. There is a case study, so we'll review that in class and uh, just exchange some treatment ideas. Another disorder, neuromuscular disorder, I want to cover is brachial plexus injury. And generally this is occurring, it's a birthing injury, um, often occurs uh, because of traction. So as the child is coming through the birth canal, uh, the pubic symphysis can kind of push down and depress the shoulder girdle, which will create a traction or a stretching injury to the brachial plexus. Um, the other t way that we could see this is with a breech presentation, which is bottom first, which is not illustrated here, and then the arm can be caught up and behind the head, and again, you can get a traction injury that way. Um, and depends on what part of the brachial plexus is stretched or damaged. Uh, usually the two most common types are one that's called Erb's palsy, which means C5 and C6 are involved, and then Klumpke's palsy, which means C8 and T1. So again, if you think back to your spinal cord injury from last semester, um, it would be really great if you stopped your video and you tried to list, write down, list all the muscles that are innervated um, at C5 and C6. Can you think of a few? Well, hopefully you stopped your video and you tried to, to write some down, um, but this picture probably helped you figure out that wrist extensors are definitely involved. Um, wrist, uh, elbow flexors are also involved, and so with Herb's palsy, you may also have some involvement of the deltoid because of the axillary nerve innervation at C5 and C6. Um, so deltoid, biceps, wrist extensors, uh, those are pretty typical muscles involved in the upper extremity. Uh, you can see in this baby on the right hand side a very typical posture. It's called the waiter's tip posture. So since the biceps aren't innervated, the arm just hangs down to gravity. Um, the shoulder's not fully innervated, so they don't lift their arm up. And then without wrist extensors, the wrist flexors, though, are still activated, so it pulls the wrist into a, a contracted, flexed posture, and so they uh, kind of look like they're standing there waiting for someone to give them a tip. Uh, this can vary in severity. Um, if it's not addressed, it can result in growth disturbances in the limb, and you can tell that that boy on the left has a very shortened upper extremity. It just hasn't grown properly. So um, 
what they would do. Uh, well, let's do, um, let me show you Klumke's palsy. Again, it's just a different part of the brachial plexus that's involved. So if we think about C8 and T1, uh, we're looking more at hand and finger involvement. So for Herb's palsy, um, some of the things we can do medically is um, Botox injections to some of the antagonistic muscles, so for example to the wrist flexors to prevent excessive activation. Um, they also, again as I said, if they have bony um, problems from not having proper development, they may need some surgery to correct those. Um, if the child, you know, this is a peripheral nerve injury, so it certainly can heal. And if the child, um, by the age of a year, one to two years, I'm sorry, if at three months they're able to flex the elbow spontaneously against gravity, then that sh shows that, you know, by the time they're a year or two old, that that's going to be pretty much resolved. Um, if they don't get that anti-gravity biceps function until three to six months, then that's going to be more limited and not until six, if they don't have it at six by six to nine months, then they're going to really have significant issues. So again, we're hoping for um, spontaneous repair of that peripheral nerve. So these are some examples. You can tell it's a, um, this is an interesting way. I mean, you could buy your child a goat. So I'm not sure. I found this obviously on the internet. I think it was for a, um, a approach for a less developed country, but I, I thought it had some really good ideas. Skipping rope, sitting back with the weight on the arms, flying a kite, swinging from a tree. You could do that, um, you know, in the monkey bars or swinging on a swing. So things that work on elevating the upper extremity and, and working on those muscles. So uh, certainly we would also work on splinting to prevent contractures and teaching the parents how to do range of motion and um, how to facilitate and encourage activities that would incorporate use of the involved extremity and help the child strengthen that arm. So we also do have a case study for uh, no not a case study I apologize we don't have a case study but um, we'll talk a little bit about some different ideas for management in class. All right, and then the last condition we're going to talk about on this video is congenital torticollis. Um, so torticollis is really um, a stress or ischemic injury to the sternocleidomastoid, um, generally unilaterally. And again, it can happen um, with trauma during the birth process, or it could just happen if there's been prolonged um, positioning in utero that wasn't normal. Um, but that's basically what it is, damage or injury or nerve injury to the sternocleidomastoid. And so what you see is the, since we know the actions of the sternocleidomastoid, can you list them? Yes, flexion, lateral flexion, rotation to the opposite side. Um, so um, from a medical management standpoint, there, there is possibility of surgery, though it's not well supported. Um, what can happen if there's if it's in utero positioning is that or um, if there's been a, an injury resulting in scar tissue that'll create essentially a, a sternocleidomastoid contracture and so they have tried some surgeries to do lengthening but they've been um, I think they have to be carefully selected to make sure that they're the right candidate. Otherwise well let me show you some symptoms first. So because of the shortening of the sternocleidomastoid. We just have to remember how malleable babies are. Um, that it really can create um, a lot of facial asymmetries because of the constant pressure that's pulling down on the on the mastoid process. And so if you look at a child um, you can see some of these asymmetries. Um, one thing that you you'll notice um, is just with the child lying in supine the head's always turned one way. And I have a cousin who's a pediatric physical therapist, and she lives in Colorado. Her sister, who lives in Minnesota, had a baby. And so, of course, they sent a lot of pictures. And so for the first few months, 
they would send a lot of pictures and, I, and, and probably after about three months my uh, cousin called back to to the mama and said you know what little baby always has his head turned to one side and so sure enough the child had a torticollis so I think it was pretty interesting that the person who diagnosed it initially was a physical therapist who just was seeing pictures of, of her uh, of her little nephew. So typical we can look at posturing but again you're going to see asymmetries in the size and shape of the head and face. So definitely need to work on range of motion um, taking the child through available range and working to gradually stretch it out. Um, so here's some home stretching. There are um, splinting splints that are available. A lot of kids wear helmets or uh, on their head to try to restore the symmetry and um, to, pr to restore the symmetry of the head and the face facial area. Um, 